This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Hi, I'm John McElroy, and thanks for joining us on AutoLine This Week. Today's guest is Alfonso Albaisa. He's the Senior Vice President of Global Design for the Nissan Corporation. Alfonso, it is so great to have you joining us on today's show. Thank you so much. It's my, my pleasure. I love seeing that Z car, the brand new one in the background. We'll be getting into that, but let me introduce our journalist panel. Gary Vasilash is with On Automotive, the publisher of the newsletter, and Paul Eisenstein is the publisher of the DetroitBureau.com. Gary and Paul, thanks for joining us as part of the journalist panel on this. Thank you, John. Great to be with you. Alfonso, let's get into it. As I said, you've got the brand new Nissan Z car that is coming back into the market after being gone for a number of years. I've only seen the pictures of it, but what really stands out to me is that it's got great proportions. It's got a great stance. It's got simple, clean lines to it. And it's almost a retro design. I mean, it really harkens back to uh, the old Z cars. So my question is, why did you go that route? And maybe not try to, or why not try to completely redefine what the Z is about? This is a great question. And um, it's been an honor to be actually part of the last three Zs. And, and, I re- and it makes me remember that even on the 350, we had one proposal that, had a kind of retro modern feeling. And to be honest, this was, we made a model and the team was passionate about that model, but it wasn't where our heart was and it wasn't where our ambition was. So we ended up with the 350 that everyone knows and it, which was very kind of techno and modern and, and powerful. The circumstances are so different when we were designing this that it's almost a flip. We had mostly designs that were reflecting on the, the love we had of the previous Zs. And even when the name, and I was finding it so funny how the word 400 was going everywhere, when from the very beginning, we were actually wanting just to call it Z because it represents all the Zs. So we had that from the very beginning where we wanted to almost skip, jump and land and touch, uh, especially 240 and 300. Um, but there's a little bit of other cars in there as well. So uh, it was very early and it was unanimous and everybody was was really quite excited about that. Gary Vasilai. Alfonso, can you talk a little bit about the team that worked on this vehicle? I mean, what, what, what were their, um, their makeup, their nature? I mean, was it a global team? Was it a U.S. team, a Japanese team, a, a amalgamation? Um, mm-hmm. Talk to us about that. Uh, this is an easy answer. Everyone, <laughs> everyone, you couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't uh, get anyone not to draw on the Z. And so, of course, the, they're funneled through their studio. So we had our London studio, our China studio, our California studio, and of course, our Japanese studio and uh, everyone participating. We even had some sketches from our Brazil studio. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's a Z and uh it comes at a time when we were a company that was reflecting on, you know, what is our, our, our purpose? What is our history? And, you know, we were designing EVs, you know, the Aria was happening at the same time. And uh, Dan Pass, I think you guys know him. Uh, he, he came to the studio and he wanted to do this project to capture this energy. And he's the one who coined A to Z because the Z is super huge important as our soul. Uh, but Aria also represented, you know, this kind of dream of how technology would change, you know, how people drive. So anyway, the the meaning of Z was just enormous in our uh, the last three years or so in our mm-hmm. life. Paul Eisenstein. You know, Alfonso, I think I'm the only one here dressed to get into that car right away. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, couple, I, I should uh, my, I should have better shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so two quick things. First of all, uh, I, 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 
as I'm talking to you now, I'm thinking about uh, comments uh, that Ma Michael Maurer, you know him, of course, mm -hmm. uh, he made when he brought out a new uh, version of the Porsche 911 not that many years ago. Mm -hmm. And we, we chatted about it. And he talked about the awesome, both the, the honor and responsibility mm -hmm. of redesigning a, an iconic brand. Uh, it's in some ways very, very important, but also in some ways very restrictive. So I, want, I wonder if you can talk about that, but also can you talk about what you've done with this design and this vehicle to future-proof it? Because Nissan has talked a lot about the electrification of its future products. So one has to think that you at least had some something in this vehicle, maybe not in the exterior design, but something that will allow it to be electrified going forward to some degree. So Polly, two points, and, and I, I would agree with this sense of the humbling uh, responsibility of doing a Z because it's not just a car, it's not a commodity. Um, you know, we probably like Porsche, the, um, the number of Zs out there. And so in that sense, it was so unique because normally we design a car and we have a target customer and, and we're understanding their life today and what are their needs of today. And they tend to be practical needs. Of course, they have emotional needs or they wouldn't be buying a, a Nissan. Um, but still, it's, it's a different exercise. When you have 1.5 million Zs you know, bouncing around the planet with probably multiple generations of owners, uh, considering the age of our wonderful Z as a name, and uh, you feel a huge responsibility that there's love out there. This is not a car just A to B. This is a car that memories were made in. So that was a little bit when the pivot happened. Because I know, Polly, we have to use the R word, the retro word. I, I understand that. But memory was the thing that we were discussing a little bit more. So yes, the, the long hood, this was very important. So you know, the, it's five inches longer than the outgoing Z, the car itself. And we wanted all of that in the hood and the beak, we wanted it quite low. We were analyzing the 240 literally because the 370 actually also has its inspiration as the 240. But it was still mingling in the pier. I want to make a new type of car. This was not, we were not, we wanted to celebrate the Z's. We wanted to celebrate the racing. We wanted to celebrate the all of the people who love Z's. And uh, we went literally through the whole 240. We analyzed the relationship of the hood and the trailing edge of the roof, which is the end of the car. And it must be around 80 mils lower than the hood fender, the fender. And you know, so our efforts with engineering and everything is, as you can imagine in the modern era, most cars are wedge shaped because that's very efficient for the wind and for downforce and all of these things. So the engineers were on board, they loved the 240. And so we did, it's a strange way to say it, that even though spiritually the, the minimalism of the 300 is very much a part of the skin of this, the iconography of details is, is, is the 240. Alfonso, let's talk about the interior a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get into most modern cars today, the mm -hmm. race is on amongst manufacturers to put as big a screen as they possibly can onto the center of the mm -hmm. instrument panel. Yes. You guys have elected to go in a very classic way. You've oh. got this, this beautiful instrument cluster that's all digital, but you've retained the classic three round analog gauges at the top of the instrument panel. Uh, there must have been a debate or was there a debate in the company whether to you know, go with the big screen or retain some of the classic analog gauges? I think we embraced the paradox. So I don't think there wasn't a debate because at the end of the day, screens of course get blamed for the, the, the audacity the presence in the interior is too heavy. But the content in those screens are things that people use and want and makes their life easier. So here we have, we have a Z and we wanted it purposeful. The, the, the beauty of the 240s interior is this is a purposeful interior. 
and an open interior actually for a small car. And so we were obsessed with that. But so unlike a lot of cars today where the nine inch screen or 10 inch screen is sitting up and it's kind of like a, a little bit like a tombstone, even on, you know, Rogue and Pathfinder, you know, <laughs> even us. Um, this, we didn't want that. The iconography of this interior is not the screens, even though by square inch, there's a lot of screens. There's a 12 and a nine. And uh, so, so it's more embracing a paradox than, than debating because we needed it, but we don't want to show it so much. But when you turn on the car, actually at the end of the day, it actually has a big visual. And we worked with uh, some of our racers and uh, so, you know, we had the 12 inch, but we didn't just want a normal thing. So with a tack in the middle and with that glowing Z in the center, the needle doesn't have a center. The needle has uh, spiritually comes from the Z inside the middle of the tack. And uh, so this was also a source of fun, a bit of digital fun um, with a car that we love deeply. So. Um, mm. So yeah, debates, yes, John, you know that probably my life is full of <laughs> debating, if you want to call that. I'm Cuban, so those debates are a little bit full of, you know. Yeah. A lot of hand gesturing. <laughs> <lot of> hand- <laughs> yes, you, got it. you know me. Uh, so Alfonso, you, you've alluded to this, but I want to ask you specifically. So to what extent did you and your team consider the coefficient of drag versus the coefficient of desire. <laughs> ah, very nice. Not sure how to answer it. Yeah, coefficient of drag. That's good. Um, the Z is about desire. And it's a weird kind of desire because it's a desire that everyone can touch, that they can get it. There are some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful sports cars in the, the entire life of Zs. There have been some tremendous sports cars, but these were for fantasies. These were, of course, school children, school boys usually, but uh, they were aware and they loved them, but the chances of them owning them is not so, so clear. The Z wasn't that type of fantasy. It was something that you can get. So probably the, the in that sense, if it's the quotient, Efficient of brag in the sense that you can get it, you can love it, you can hand it to your your children, you can you can get another one, you can. It's a fully immersive fantasy, and um, this was we are very aware of this, and um, but it's a performance car. It's got 400 horsepower. You know, we spent a lot of time mating it to a manual transmission, and mating it to to a new a new gearbox. Uh, on our our nine speed and so there was a lot of effort and we knew this was a beast and I've driven and you haven't driven and I shouldn't I I need to respect my my gentlemen friends so I won't talk too much about how it behaved but um, I actually you know I my I've lost hairs from the the emotional reaction um, of that drive Hmm. Elvon, so I want to get back to that electrification question. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, what did you take into account for future technology? Because everything, it seems, is going to go to some form of hybridization, if not pure electric. And I can't imagine you won't. And the reality is electrification makes for some great performance behavior. Instant torque and such, uh, that's becoming harder to match with a regular internal combustion engine. And and as you look at it, what does that say about the future of, of what sports cars will be from Nissan as the brand does go electric? You know, on this one, basically I, I agree with everything you're saying. It's, it's a major player. It's a, no matter how, if you're on the fence or not on the fence, it, the reality is that the way electric cars behave already are fundamentally fast cars. Now, the Z, I have to be completely honest to, to you guys and the viewers, that we didn't have those considerations about designing this car. So the, you had a great word, uh, how do we future-proof this car? In a sense that emotionally, we, 
were able to escape that pressure because this is a celebration of many cars. It's not so much, it is a car for the future. It's a car that is modern and it's forward looking and, and, and our love of shape and sculpture was not retro in a specific sense. But the company right away freed us from that kind of electrification, even hybridization uh, mm. subject. They wanted us to make a beautiful car that had the heart of the biggest hearts of our past. And the Z represents our soul. So this is a big enough meal for us to digest. And uh, so I really appreciate that the, the, the bosses uh, really uh, you know, allowed us to, in our A to Z, there's a wide range of, of vehicles that covered that subject. And that the Z was an important moment um, for us to really you know, pay respect to those who have loved us. And uh, so that's what we were thinking about. Alfonso, of course, you're the, the head of all Nissan design. And I'm wondering, maybe looking beyond the Z a little bit and getting back to aerodynamics, what are your thoughts on active aero devices on cars? You know, we've got air curtains, we've got you know, grill shutters, we've got deployable rear, rear spoilers. Seems to me there's even more opportunity. And especially as uh, emission uh, regulations get stricter, uh, and hence cars need to become more efficient. And especially if they're electric, you know, you want to extend the range as much as possible, maybe even reduce the cost of the car by putting in a smaller battery pack. Seems to me aerodynamics could play a role in that. So are, are you looking at more in terms of active aerodynamic devices on cars? Very much so. And actually, I, I'd like to share something that I haven't spoken publicly about, is that actually even in our design process, where you know designers start searching for themes and, and doing all this stuff about the thematic, the artistic part. Yes, we're talking thinking about the customer with product planning and, and yes, engineering is working with us. Um, but now we're working a little bit differently that we are asking engineers to give us the perfect aerodynamic shape first. Hmm. And hmm. then because the, the, the things that are needed in the future are not easy at all because yes if you if you have a hybrid if you have an ev the reality is batteries are not free and that uh, the the customers are not really that happy when you raise the msrp of a car so something's got to give so the thing that gives is efficiency needs to double or whatever the number is Mm -hmm. So yes, all the active stuff, so the physical or mechanical things, yes, we are, we are doing, but also from a mindset point of view, we are embracing the experimentation of our brothers and sisters in engineering. And we're allowing them to get into our upstream and educate us about things that maybe we should have known, okay, in full transparency. But, uh, but that now we really need to take seriously. And I, and I love this sense of science uh, because I feel this is part of the Japanese DNA of technology. So I'm quite excited about the artistic opportunity that science, shape derived by science, is going to give us for the next generation of cars. So, so let me pick up on that. Um, my understanding is that the fourth generation Z was designed on a Cray supercomputer with CAD. Mm -hmm. So can, can you tell us whether you guys are using new technologies, whether it's 3D printing or virtual reality to develop the, the Z or any of the other vehicles that, that Nissan is bringing to market? Yeah, I'm a fully uh, VR, completely. I have goggles at my desk. I don't even need to move. Uh, maybe because, you know, we, I, I think in the U.S. we invented the remote control. For the, <laughs> so somehow in the DNA, uh, there's a, a sense that I don't want to get up. <laughs> so uh, my office is, has all the, the sensors now. I know VR, we don't need those anymore, but I've had it for three years. So developing of all the Nissan Next cars and the Z especially, uh, I'm viewing all the proposals from the global studios in VR, and I have live VR, and I'm talking to my teammates in California and in London, and it's live. 
and I see their little kind of avatars moving around in the environment. And uh, this project was heavily developed digitally. And the 240 digitized, 300 digitized. And you know, it's interesting how that made the, the process quite interesting. Because it's not an issue of efficiency. It's an issue about information. Because I was obsessed with, as I mentioned, the hood and the trailing edge of the roof line. And I really wanted to know when did the Z stop having that the rear was lower than the fender. And by having the data, and of course I could have just measured a car in the sidewalk, but when you're in VR and you see it, and you can turn it and you can cut sections, and then you move it to the new package and you're negotiating, you know, please, please give me 10 more millimeters. Uh, I want the nose lower, I want it longer. And the digital process lets this, these negotiations and discussions to be very fluid. And uh, the VR has made it amazing. And if I could just one last comment about VR, live VR makes voices that were silent hmm. Um, right next to you. You know, we used to have, of course, these classic, you know, you take three models outside, people are standing, and people end up chatting a little bit with each other, and then when they're asked, they say something. In VR, nine people are hooked up, and you hear breathing. And people then, the sense of the communication, ironically, People criticize digital as not being tangible or not personal, but the voice of everyone is ringing inside a, a little bit like this microphone uh, today, this earpiece. You hear everything. You hear people's feeling. You hear grunting or like, mm, you know, this sense of questioning. And you see what they're looking at. Uh, at the end, it has made my daily life much more intimate ironically, to be digital. So it's a bit of a contradiction, but it's real. Yeah. I know in this industry that uh, in some ways this is already a very old project. Uh, you, you're always working so many years ahead. So at, with all the tools you have at hand and with all the changes coming to the industry over the next few years, what can you give us a sense of what you imagine your next sports car, whether it's the next generation of the Z or perhaps something that takes advantage of all the new technologies, whether as John was talking about uh, Active Aero and Gary with some of the design freedom that you have from all the, the, the new supercomputer technologies where you can just look at things you might never have done before. What if you had to do a new sports car now going forward, how different would it be than what the Z car is. Well, I'm glad you didn't ask me about the GTR. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> well, I was hinting but, at it. <laughs> yeah, of course that the, the, you know, the, the digital tools which have been used for design and actually engineering has vast array of digital tools for simulation. But I think what's going to happen next is these tools are going to start getting merged. And so between design and engineering, you're going to be able to have much more of a borderless relationship. And sports cars are just going to continue to be great and better and better. And the ability to understand how a car is behaving at high speed, low speed, heavy braking, that more and more we're going to be able to know exactly what is happening, even in a car that doesn't exist yet. But what? Yeah. But 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 what will be different, perhaps, in the way they look? Uh, oh, there'll be much more. I, I believe that uh, there's going to be much more aerodynamics because, as you're mentioning and you're implying, the level of electrification is going to increase, and it's not free. It's not only free money, but it's heavy, and you. So you there's going to be great pressure to not have a lot of batteries. And then that means that the design itself is going to have to be a miracle. The way it goes through the wind, 
So mm -hmm. you're going to be playing with your new best friend, which is the wind. <laughs> and, uh, and you're going to play in a serious manner. Um, it, it, will you have the, a long nose just because that's what people associate with it? with a sports car, but you have the motors and batteries underneath. I mean, how much of a change will there be? Will it look anything like today's sports cars? Well, I think that what we're going to see very quickly is that uh, the minimalization of things. So even though um, hmm. there are battery packs that are thinning, 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 this is fine. But the electric motors are going to keep getting smaller, smaller, smaller. The, the capacity and the, the aspects of what is inside the car related to charging is going to change. And there's probably a lot of theories out there. And I do believe that the things that make the, the rocket fly um, are going to keep getting smaller. So you're going to see much more freedom in the expression of shape. And the cars, I think, are going to appear a little bit more naked in the sense of not needing to cover huge volumes. They're, of course, going to have to cover us and protect us um, as humans. But I do think that this is going to be much more science. At least that's my conviction. That, uh, But like a long nose or no nose and these kind of things, I think that the, the, the wind is going to, have, is there going to be a small strong player. That's very interesting to hear what you're saying there, Alfonso, and I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this conversation up, but thank you so much for your time today. Thank Gary you. Vasilash, Paul Eisenstein, I want to thank the th two of you, and of course, everybody who's tuning in. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. 